All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, welcome everyone uh, for this new reading group session organized by Continual AI. Uh, today we have the pleasure to host Ali Ayub uh, from uh, the Pennsylvania State University, who is going to talk about EEC, learning to encode and regenerate images for continual learning. So thank you so much, Ali, for being here with us today. And the stage is yours. Thank you for inviting me. It's always fun to see familiar faces <laughs> from different conferences and stuff, you know. Um, uh, but anyways, I'll just start with the paper first and then um, we can talk about if you have any questions. Um, so yeah, like Vincent said, I'm Ali Yu. I'll be presenting my paper. Uh, which uh, it has been accepted actually at ICLR 2021. Um, so yeah, let's start with that. Okay, so uh, I guess we are in this group, so I'm pretty sure everyone knows now. Um, generally, batch learning systems are like the, uh, well, they were the norm, <laughs> um, uh, I guess two or three years ago, but now incremental learning or continual learning is like the, um, uh, one of the new fields where like machine learning systems are trained um, in incremental steps so that they can be improved over time without requiring all the data to be available in a single batch. Um, uh, and most of the approaches, and I think pretty much um, uh, a lot of continual, commu uh, continual learning community already knows that most of the approaches have used these um, idea of storing the data or partial data of the old classes. For example, ICAR, one of the famous approaches, and many after that um, use this idea of this um, storing old class data and using distillation loss. Um, distillation loss, uh, for those who don't know, um, is like uh, a loss term that is used to um, make the model like um, have same or similar labels predicted for the um, classes for the um, sorry, for the images that were trained on the previous model and the new model. So, for example, if uh, in the first increment I train the model to produce a label, um, it should produce a similar label on the old tasks um, or even the same task when it is trained on the new data so that to avoid the change on um, weights. Um, however, the distillation loss itself has like a very counterintuitive um, idea that you are trying to um, like it's like um, I guess you're like trying to avoid the model to learn, and um, that is kind of counterintuitive um, because the other loss function, the cross entropy loss function, with that in that particular increment is always trying to make it you know learn using gradient descent. Um, but anyways, the main uh, issue that has been pointed out by some of the paper, some of the um, other works in continual learning, and obviously in this paper I've mentioned that um, one could be the memory exhaustion, that if you're storing a lot of data, especially if it's high resolution data, like um, most images generally they're used in papers are 32 by 32. But if you go, let's say 224 by 224, the memory like it, um, storage increases drastically. Um, it can lead to privacy and security issues. Um, and uh, also they're not biologically inspired because you can't you don't really need to store a large amount of like episodic memory or like the real data that you know you learned before um and uh, to deal with this um there are some approaches that have been proposed um there are some approaches that use pre-trained networks um to avoid this, you know, using like a large amount of data, they use a pre-trained network so that they can store feature vectors instead of using the images. Uh, however, using pre-trained networks, obviously it has, has its own limitations. For example, um, if the new data differs drastically from the old data. So let's just say I'm using a um, pre-trained network ResNet on ImageNet, um, but I'm trying to learn data that is seen classes. Obviously, that's going to be an issue because the image net was trained on object classes. Um, so these are the kind of issues that can arise. Um, so one way to deal with this uh, 
strict class instrumental learning problem, which I call it, where you don't allow storage of any real samples, is using generated memory. And it has been used before. Um, generally, most of the approaches have used um, GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks, to re regenerate um, data. And um, uh, some of you also have tried autoencoders, um, but the thing with um, issue with autoencoders is that they usually generate blurry images, and uh, that can hurt classifier performance by a lot. And uh, GANs generally can produce better images than autoencoders, but there have been issues still, and especially looking at previous works and uh, um, their accuracy or like their performance um, on trying to remember previous data. Um, it has been pretty clear that, you know, they, on complex data sets, especially on ones where there are RGB images, um, their accuracy is still pretty low and they can suffer from, well, some catastrophic reading, uh, which I'll show later in the results section. Um, yeah. Okay, so in this paper, um, we use autoencoders to deal with the, um, the, to generate images for the old classes. Um, uh, but to deal with the blurriness problem, um, the idea that we use is called neural style transfer. Um, and neural style transfer algorithm itself is actually um, used to generate um, or change the images. So for example, you have like an original image and you have like another content image um, and you're trying, or, uh, you're trying to like um, make the image, whatever the input image was, look most like the content image. Uh, there is another image in the, you can also add another image with the neural style transfer algorithm to, it's called a style uh, image, but we don't really um, need that in this, and I'm not, I won't really go into detail in that, but if someone asks a question uh, afterward, I can explain. Um, so the idea essentially in neural style transfer, as I stated, is that you want your input image to look most like the content image. And uh, in that, they generally use a um, pre-trained network. Um, they pass the images both from that and uh, get convolutional features and use usually from like, if you're using a VGG or AlexNet from like the fifth layer. Um, and then um, they find the convolutional features, get the loss by, you know, just a Euclidean distance loss between the convolution features and um, and using that, they would try to um, update the input image. Um, in this case, in our case, essentially what we want is that our reconstructed image um, looks most like the real image. Because if that's if that's the case, then we won't really have a big issue when training uh, my classifier on generated data, data from the previous classes. So, so for this case, um, in each new increment, so imagine this is the first increment, um, we first train the classifier model, which is just ResNet 18. Um, we train that on, let's say, the original data of the current increment. So let's just say in the first increment, I get C for 110 classes. I train that on um, tra ResNet, I train it on the first, the data of the first 10 classes. And then, then I train the autoencoder I like a very shallow convolutional autoencoder. I use that and train it um, using the data of the current increment. So, for example, the 10 you know classes that were just learned by the classifier. Now, the classifier itself can now be used as that feature extractor, so that we don't need any pre-trained feature extractor. We can use the classifier uh, because it was just trained on the classes that were pretty much learning in the autoencoder. So, it this a classifier can generate those convolutional features uh, for these classes. So essentially the idea is that uh, we train the autoencoder using this uh, reconstruction loss and the content loss, which is from like the idea from the uh, neural style transfer. So we use a classifier that was just trained on these classes, get convolutional features, and then um, you cleared in this mean distance between these features, and then you get the content loss, and the combination of this is used to train the autoencoder. Um, generally, we recruit a new autoencoder for each new increment so that we don't have to retrain an autoencoder back, um, you know, on generated data because it, it will degrade performance like more. Um, 
and uh, this doesn't really cause a lot of memory issue either but i'll explain that at the end because these are very shallow autoencoders um but we can retrain an autoencoder if there is a need um and i'll again talk about that in the results section um uh, this is these are a couple of examples these are from imagenet uh, uh, data set and this was uh, generated without the neural style and this was generated with the neural style transfer algorithm. And obviously there's a huge difference between the blurriness that you see um, in the two different kind of images. Anyways, um, so moving on. Um, now to regenerate data, we still need for, for the autoencoders, we need these feature vectors. We call them encoded episodes. Um, uh, so essentially we can you know save all the feature vectors and obviously it will be much less much lesser memory than the actual images um, but in case our system does run out of memory we use this idea inspired by the memory integration process in the um, hippocampus and the neocortical system um, of the human brain uh, in which the idea is that uh, the memory integration is used to combine different episodes or concepts into like single concepts um just um uh, the process is essentially like you keep combining similar um encoded episodes or episodes uh, into concepts uh so similar to that idea um we we keep combining encoded episodes um iteratively to generate um centroids and covariance matrices so we pretty much cluster them and uh, uh once we reach like a particular limit that our memory limit is, is reached. Essentially, we stop that uh, in you know clustering process, um, store the centroids and covariance matrices, and for covariance ma matrices, we only use the diagonal entries just to reduce memory. And uh, after storing them uh, in the form of centroids and covariances, we just remove the encoded episodes that were used to generate those centroids and covariance matrices. So essentially, you know that's we can keep doing this process um, and. Theoretically, we can essentially store an entire class using a single centroid and covariance matrix. Obviously, that would be really bad and like it won't generate a good performance. But essentially, if you run out of memory that much, then you can just do that. Um, yeah, so anyways, um, further now to train the classifier, let's just say in the first increment, um, you know, there was on, there were only real images, so you didn't have this generated data coming from the autoencoder uh, but let's just say in the second or third increment you know next all of the next increments the classifier is trained on three different streams of data first is the real images uh, that are from the current increment then there are reconstructed images uh, which we call like we use the decoder um, that was trained using those images and pretty much pass the encoded episodes or feature vectors um, generate that data and pass it through the classifier. Um, last, we call this process rehearsal. Um, and I know the terminology has been used differently. So for now, let's just stick with this one. Um, and uh, then we use this process called pseudo rehearsal. In this process, we actually sample these centroids and covariance matrices in the form of Gaussian distribution. So each centroid and covariance matrix serves uh, a serves as serve, serve as the parameters of a Gaussian distribution and we sample them to generate a large amount of pseudo encoded episodes which is like pseudo exemplars or pseudo feature vectors um, of the same size as encoded episodes we pass all of those pseudo encoded episodes through the decoder to generate essentially pseudo images and after generating those pseudo images um there is another step that we can do which is to filter those images and then pass them through the classifier or we can just generate the you know the amount required and then just simply pass it if there is a filtering process then what we can do is that we can generate a very large number and then um we can actually pass those images again from the so uh, let me pause that here <laughs> so so in the filtering process uh we use the classifier as the uh, prediction network not a training in that process there is no training involved um, in that case we can pass the images and get the predicted label or predicted loss for all those pseudo images again remember this classifier that we're using here is just as a prediction uh, network and that 
classifier was trained and it already has been trained on the real images of those essential pseudo images uh, classes. And uh, when we pass those pseudo images through the classifier and get the um, labels, uh, we can see like, okay, which images, which pseudo images are generating the correct label that they are supposed to belong to. And then we can filter them out um, that are producing the correct labels or the less amount of loss across entropy loss. And using that, we can just, um, you know, keep a specific amount that was needed um, and then, then pass them through this decoder, sorry, then pass them uh, through this streamline of training the classifier. So remember, filter process, first you use the classifier as the um, a prediction network, no training involved, and then you use it as a, you know, to train the network, you use that filter data uh, with real data and reconstructed data. Okay. Um, here is actually an example on an MNIST data set. We, uh, we use the autoencoder with um, two dimensional embedding size, just size just so that we can show the uh, embeddings generated by the autoencoder. And we just wanted to show on two classes on MNIST data sets uh, how our pseudo rehearsal process looks like and what um, and if it is efficient. So this is the first the first figure A is actually all the embedded uh, feature vectors or encoded episodes for the two classes. There are about 8,300, I think, classes, oh, sorry, uh, feature vectors here. Then we uh, show that um, we can store about 4,000 sensors and covariance matrices and then regenerate data. So essentially, there are some uh, real feature vectors here. Um, and there are some uh, in the figure B, there are some real factor, feature vectors here and some regenerated data using pseudo rehearsal from 4,000 centroid and covariance matrices. Um, and then there is a similar thing we generated through 2,000 centroid and covariance matrices, 1,000 and then 200. In the case of 200 and 1,000, there are very few, actually, in, in case of 200, there are no real uh, feature vectors left. And in 1,000, I think there were very few um, uh, feature vector, real feature vectors left. But what we can see is that our this the real um, the embedding space that was covered or the concept that was covered by the two classes has been kept even when we reduce all the way to 200 centaurs and commanders matrices, which is a huge you know difference in memory because you're almost like um, 20 times lower, like you're using 20 times lower memory, but you're still keeping um, a similar um concept or the overall concept of the feature space obviously there is it's more condensed because again you're generating from the center and commanders matrices and they're still going to generate uh data around them mostly cluster around those things so it's more um kind of choppy and not very continuous i guess um you, you have less data on the fringes um and you're starting to lose some of the fine like um um uh, details but Again, that's just because you've lost um, so much memory and you know information. But again, still the overall idea is that it can still keep this overall concept, and then um, hopefully these reconstructed images or sorry pseudo images uh, generated from this pseudo data would be closer to the actual real data, which is you know this one. Um, finally, the last step that we add in our work is that uh, a decay function. Uh, which is actually the idea is that those reconstructed and pseudo images, even though we try our best best to make them look like our original images, uh, they could still look very different or they could still be degraded. And that will hurt classifier performance because if you train it on that kind of data um, and you're telling it like, okay, um, this is just as good as the real data, obviously the classifier performance will get hurt. So what we do is that we actually introduce this um, small um, weighting function called sample decay weight, uh, which is actually dependent on a simple coefficient that's um, that was a hyperparameter. Um, there is a way we can set this value, but I can explain that later if someone asked. Um, and uh, we call this sample decay coefficient and alpha. That is simply the number of times auto encoder has been trained. So in our case, if we just use a single autoencoder one time, then it will be just one, so it won't really any affect anything. But the more times you train this, the higher this number will be, and the low, uh, sorry, the the decay factor will be lower. Uh, sorry, the this 
weight will be lower and essentially um, it will reduce the effect of the loss function here. But anyways, the overall loss function to train the classifier and increment is the training on the real data, training on reconstructed data and training on pseudo data. And for the pseudo and reconstructed data, we add these um, sample decay weights so that we can reduce the effect um, while training the classifier. So just to tell it, hey, you know, um, the training data uh, that is coming here is actually much better. It's real data, and these two might not be as important as this one. <clears throat> so this is like a kind of a trade-off over there. Uh, so yeah, so like I said, the overall loss function would kind of look like this. And we have a different um, gamma, uh, the sample decay coefficient for pseudo images and reconstructed images. Um, obviously, it will be higher for pseudo images because they would be degraded more than the original images. Uh, but again, I can explain how the how gamma was chosen. Uh, so to compare against other approaches, um, I uh, well, we compared against um, some episodic memory approaches, which essentially, you know, they store the real images of the previous classes and some generative memory approaches. These um, simply generate data. Pretty much all of them use GANs to generate data. Um, and most of them use a um, uh, regularization term within it, um, the elastic weight consolidation. I, if someone asks, I can explain that, but I, I, was, I was hoping that everyone would know that's why I didn't really go into detail of that. Uh, but anyways, um, for this paper, we actually perform experiment on four different data sets, actually five. There was another one in the supplementary, but here I'm just going to show um, for a quick results. I, I'll just show on two data sets. Uh, but if someone again asks, I can show results on um, uh, all five data sets. Um, but anyways, the first idea was to train it, uh, test it on MNIST, which has been actually used pretty much by all of these generative memory approaches. So this is kind of a norm, I guess, uh, in the uh, generative memory based continual learning community. So we tried it on that, but as you can see that the results are pretty much saturated. This is joint training that is batch learning and these our approach and even a couple of other approaches um, produce very similar accuracy to this uh, batch learning, which kind of shows that um, probably uh, this is not a good data set to test generating memory based continual learning approaches. So just to um, increase the complexity, um, increase the complexity, we tested on well, actually we tested on C410, C400 data sets, but here I'm just going to test show the results on imaging at 50. Uh, this is just a small subset of the ImageNet dataset. It has uh, 50 classes um, uh, chosen randomly, and we perform uh, 10 different runs. So in all these 10 different runs, we get 50 different classes uh, randomly chosen. Um, and in each increment, we um, train on 10 classes. So essentially, we train the model on five increments. Uh, this was done just to have a fair comparison with uh, previous works like um, DGMW and EIL, ICARL, um, just to have like a fair comparison. The settings were kept the same. And again, as you can see that, unlike these other approaches, uh, the approach was actually able to achieve much like significantly higher accuracy, um, showing that it can deal with this um, complex data set just as well, or okay, just as well as the uh, simpler data sets. However, the difference in our approach and the uh, joint training is actually much higher. Um, this again is because of the complexity of the problem and uh, showing again that there is still a lot of room to be improved uh, in even our approach, uh, but it is significantly, it is a significant improvement over the previous works. Uh, in this case, A3 is representing the results, the average incremental accuracy um, for three increments and A5 is representing average incremental accuracy for five increments. Um, and for MNIST it was A5, essentially it was five increments and 10 increments. Um, here are some of the reconstructed images for the two data sets. And there are a lot more in the paper um, if someone wants to go look at it um, and in the supplementary material as well. Um, but again, as I showed before, there is um, not a very big blurriness problem. There might be some, I guess you can see in ImageNet, but uh, for MNIST, it's pretty much 
the real data almost. Um, and finally, we actually perform a memory uh, analysis of our approach just to see how much memory requires uh, to store the, if we just store the entire data sets encoded episode, that is a feature vectors. Um, and with the training model and the auto encoders, it requires about 111 uh, megabytes. Uh, the other approach that the current state of the art method that uses generated memory, it uses about 228 MB on the ImageNet 50 data set, which is about our approach is like half there, um, using half their memory space. Um, and this is uh, again when we are using pretty much the all the encoded episodes. So for ImageNet data set for 50 classes, it's about 65,000 feature vectors. Um, when we reduce it to about K is about 5,000, that is 5,000 total. So essentially 2,500 centroids and covariance matrices. Um, so from 65,000, we're going back to 2,500. Uh, EEC still achieves about 10% higher accuracy in, ter uh, in terms of A5, you know, five, uh, and then 13% higher accuracy in terms of A, sorry, A3 and A5 uh, for three increments and five increments. Uh, and memory use in this case is about 50 megabytes. Uh, and most of the memory is actually coming from the ResNet model because that takes about, I think, 40 something MB. Um, so which is about 78% lower memory space used by um, DGMW, um, which again shows that our approach kind of deals with two main problems of continual learning. Uh, it is catastrophic forgetting and uh, the memory storage issues. Thank you. And I can, again, I think there might be a lot of details. I tried to make the presentation as small as possible. I didn't know what was the time limit. So if anyone has questions, I can, ha I have some backup slides just to, uh, just in case have people have questions or if they have other details or stuff they want to know about. Because there were some other things that we did in the paper. But again, like I said, because uh, timing, I wasn't sure I tried to make it as um, short as possible. <laughs> All right, well, thanks. Yeah, uh, sure, uh, Ali, that, that was great. Uh, also in terms of timing. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the chat. <laughs> okay, I'll try to go to that if I can. Uh, I think I might stop sharing to go see. I can share slides again if someone wants to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. So Great. you should be okay. able to see a comment yes. from Gabriele yeah. Graffietti yeah. uh, with yeah. a few questions, actually. Yeah, uh, I um, think so. so. Let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, he, he had to leave. You had to leave early. So, uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, we can take all these questions so you can read them. Uh, I mean, uh, watch the recording later on and, and see the answers. Um, okay, so I think the first question is that in your basic strategy, EEC, if I understood correctly, you use an autoencoder for every incremental task. But in EECS, you use a single autoencoder for all the tasks. Could you provide more details on training on this single autoencoder? OK, so for training on the single autoencoder, I mean, you pretty much uh, regenerate data from the previously stored, um, I guess, the encoded episodes and the pseudo, if you have pseudo encoded episode, you regenerate data and then train using the reconstructed images um, from the previous classes and the real images from the current class. So um, obviously, again, it's not a very efficient process and that's that does lead to a degradation of images, especially in the later increments. So I don't think so that approach will be scalable for a long period of time. Uh, I think maybe in this work, it was not a lot of increments, so maybe that's why there wasn't a lot of degradation, but to be honest, I think it will um, it will see some issues in scalability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, second question is about ImageNet full. I'm also doing some experiment, continually generating ImageNet data, but I have not obtained very good results. Could you provide more details on how you are able to obtain such high accuracies? I think you need a you use a different outer encoder for the one you use with 32 by 32 images. Yes. Okay. So for that, actually, so. And I think I'll, I, like I said, I didn't explain that. So we did perform experiments on a um, higher resolution images, and we did achieve high, um, 
significantly higher accuracy. Um, that was, again, one, I would say that in that case, we did use a single auto encoder every single time. We didn't use regenerate. I think if we did that, that would actually reduce accuracy. Uh, but again, the, sh the size of the auto encoder, so even in the previous case, it's about 0.2 megabytes. It takes, yeah, so it's not a very, um, uh, it doesn't take a lot of memory compared to the ResNet, which takes about 48 megabytes. Um, for that case, the auto encoder was different, yes. Um, if we use the same auto encoder, the memory storage issue is a little higher, but the accuracy is also significantly better. If we use the um, different auto encoder to reduce the memory size, again, um, the accuracy is achieved lower, uh, but it's still like the hit is not as big. Again, it's because I think we are, I think it's because of the neural style transfer algorithm and the fact that we can add this weighting scenario within that, that we can reduce the, somehow the effect of those, I guess. So the, the more degraded your images are, the lower this value of this uh, weight function with the loss um, because the gamma that we trained over here or tuned was actually based on the accuracy that the model would achieve using the reconstructed images compared to the ratio of the accuracy that would achieve when it would have real images. So, you know, the more degraded the images become, the lower the weight. So essentially the model is being um, trained on lesser effect from those images. I think these could be the reasons for that. I can explain more if you, I guess, if you can email me or something. Yeah. Um, and I'll try to upload the code. Um, I've been busy with some stuff, so I'll try to put that if, uh, if I can uh, soon. Then I think last question on imaging that you obtain much accuracy using full size images and smaller images in your opinion, why using bigger data yields a higher accuracy. I thought that using bigger data poses more difficulties on the training. Okay, yes. Uh, so actually, yes, but if you just check, um, forget about continual learning, let's just say go batch learning scenario, bigger data will actually reduce better accuracy because you know you have better information about the image and the whole contours and everything. So the classifier can learn a better um, representation of the model. Um, the issue with bigger data is actually with the autoencoder, the generation part, not the classification. If you can generate good data, uh, from the autoencoder or your GAN, whichever one you're using, then you can actually achieve higher accuracy. It just depends on the autoencoder training. So that again, like I said, is we are, I already explained that it's because of some of these ideas that we use. Um, it could be, um, again, I'm, I can re like uh, explain that if you maybe send, he sent an email and yeah, that would be fine, yeah. Uh, but if anyone has more questions about that, I can explain more. Okay, I think we have another question. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what is the intuition behind generating non-blurry images for generative replay? For example, there has been work in data compression that shows training a glass for images with bl blurry images achieve similar or higher accuracy when trained with, okay. I am actually not familiar with that work. If there is, I would be, I would be happy to look at that if you can cite that to that training with blurry images achieves similar or higher accuracy. I I actually tried it myself. I mean, I, I don't know how it can, they did that. I, I mean, I would be happy to look at how they did it if you can cite the work, but um, if most of the work on autoencoders, they have used generally free trained networks to get feature vectors, and then they use autoencoders on top of the feature vectors. So for example, if you go look at FearNet, uh, this was ICLR 2018, or uh, another paper that was just published in ECCV, it's called Remind Your Neural Network, I think. Something that they also use uh, uh, like, you know, data compression, but they also try to use a pre-trained network to get those feature vectors and then use anything on top of that. And there are a couple others, I've mentioned them in the paper, you can look, I've compared against them in the sub, like appendix. Um, where I'm, I'm, so all of those approaches, whichever you use, uh, like uh, conditional auto variational auto encoders or a couple other types, they try to use a pre trained network, get the feature vectors, and then apply that. So, but I'm not familiar with this. Uh, if you can cite the work, that would be very uh, helpful. I can go look at it. Okay, great. I think that's the reference. Um, Thank you.
yeah we'll we will check it yeah. out yeah i'll <laughs> but, uh, check it out because i'm uh yeah i'll have to go look at it i mean on, on a very intuitive level um i mean it makes sense that you can somehow um yeah. Yeah. Uh, avoid recreating recreating so much details that are so many so common let's say natural images right so essentially you don't you don't need to replay at that kind of level uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, yeah i mean it, it is true what you say ali that uh, i mean I, my experience i've not seen many works so that they 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 can somehow generate, uh, let's say, blurry uh, images, but with high quality replay, let's say, value. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. no, I mean, yeah, true. I mean, yeah, this is just, I'm being an honest opinion that I've just, I haven't seen any, um, and there could be a way, I think, to, you're right, I think, especially in batch learning scenarios, there could be ways to um, help improve, because you might not need all the details, it depends on how much blurriness is there. Um, but yeah, I, th um, I I will go look at the work and thanks a lot for the reference um, and see how they do that. Um, uh, I think we have another question. I wonder if the issue for continual learning comes from the fact that some images are high fidelity new tasks and others are blurry. So the network has to learn to handle both. Oh, yes, yes. OK, yeah, you're right. This could actually be a big issue um, that uh, new images are coming from a different almost distribute like almost a f different data set almost and the previous ones oh i might actually try maybe training the autoencoder first and then just um training the classifier network always on reconstructed images never using real images this could work okay yeah i could try that all right <laughs> yeah because you know just to check this idea that if this is really the issue um that uh, real images uh, and the uh, reconstructed images are different, so the classifier yeah. maybe is confused or something. Um, yeah, I can try that. Thanks a lot. I think this might actually be a good idea. Um, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Tyler. And uh, do we have any more questions? You can also speak up, guys. But yeah, we have another question on the or comment on the chat. Okay. Uh, okay, we have one from Lucas, plus one to that point. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> one found, <laughs> I found that for multi-head setting, you can have blurry images since all images from the same task have a similar, oh yes, you're right. That could actually, yeah, you're right. For the multi-head evaluation, this could work. Um, hmm because all of them co are coming from the same task. So this could actually uh, pretty, I think it could produce better accuracy. I don't think so, it would be like still exceptional or maybe they did, I don't know. He's, I think they cited a paper here as well. Um, I can I can look at the paper as well. Um, yeah, but I think you're right. Uh, this could actually work in that scenario, in the multi-head scenario, but uh, yeah. And actually, I think Aditya, added another comment. Um, when you have a single autoencoder, is there potential for forgetting in the autoencoder? Yeah, yeah, that's essentially what I was saying earlier, that if you keep doing that, I don't think so it will be scalable if you do it for a very long period of time. Yes, so there will be a lot more potential for forgetting in the autoencoder. Uh, okay, we have another one. Uh, it's just, we don't, I don't know the name. Um, I'm wondering how much the pseudo and reconstructed features contribute to the classification loss function. Uh, yeah, so that depends on the degradation. So the more they degrade, the lesser they will contribute to the loss function. Um, so that's essentially how that is uh, defined. Um, because uh, I said the gamma parameter uh, that I use, and that's in the paper as well. Uh, I explain how uh, it's like you take the ratio of the accuracy achieved by the reconstructed images and uh, original images and however much degradation, degradation there is in the accuracy, you just um, take that as the gamma in that scenario. Yeah. All right, I guess we are done. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> are there <laughs> any more questions uh, for Ali? Otherwise, we can close this session. <laughs>
yeah or you can email me as well um uh you know yeah i'd be happy to respond to any questions or you know help yeah whichever yep so thank you so much again guys for being here thank you ali for your great presentation you can um maybe upload your slides send the link to your slides in the mm -hmm. forum where we have already a topic ready for you uh, where we can uh, continue the discussion on this paper mm -hmm. and i'll see you guys all um, to um, the next reading group session uh friday next week same time thank you so much yeah. thanks a lot thanks see uh, you guys bye yeah. bye